This is Center Stage, putting your firm in the spotlight by highlighting business owners and other industry experts to help take your firm to the next level. Hey everyone, and welcome to Center Stage. I'm your host, John Henson, and this week we are talking about something different uh, this week. Uh, we're talking about corruption. And, and what that might look like in a smaller firm. And I think oftentimes we think about corruption, in, you know, in, a, in more broad terms, maybe it's in larger organizations or, you know, even governments and stuff like that. But our guest this week, uh, Susanna Sierra from BH Compliance, uh, she has seen it in firms and businesses of all sizes. And she is joining us this week to talk about what it would look like uh, and maybe even what smaller firms can do to prevent it or address it if it does come up. So Susanna, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. So uh, real quick before we dive in, uh, just let everybody know a little bit about you, how you got into this world. Okay, it's very interesting because I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I study business. I'm from Chile. And I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I was like looking for new opportunities and I was working with entrepreneurs. I was founded a foundation to help them, it was called Independizate and was a lot in, in that world. But then one day in Chile, a new law came and was the criminal liability law for companies. And what, what said that law is really similar to the FCPA, to the Foreign Corrupt Practices, uh, about bribery and a lot of uh, and, and other crimes that companies can benefit from them. So this law says that if a company commits a crime as bribery or money laundry, for example, that actually benefit that company, then the company is responsible. And what that means, or what are like the sanctions for that, could be since sanctions like uh, money sanctions until the dissolution of the company. That is like the the dead penalty for companies or or something right. like that. So, so that law was this was 2009 in Chile, and I was with all my projects and everything. And my father, that actually has a rating company. He told me, oh, this is very interesting because you want to be an entrepreneur and this, this could be good to make an, a business plan. And I said, okay, I can make a business plan, but this is so boring. I don't want to work in compliance. And, but, and my business plan was actually perfect in an Excel with all the numbers and with, with all the companies in Finland. I said, all the companies need this. I need to, because the law said that, that they need to certify, certify their compliance programs to prove that they were doing everything to prevent. And I start with my business plan. And my father told me, well, you don't keep uh, a time trying to prove your business plan. I said, oh, okay, but I have all these things, but okay, I'm going to prove that I'm okay with my business plan. And I start going to companies, 2010, 2011, around. And was really surprising when, when companies, but actually people inside companies, like, and, but especially like the, the, the people in charge of these kind of things, like the legal manager or the legal council or the audit person. And they told me, no, but we don't need this. This law is not for us. And I said, how is that it's not for you? Yes, because we are not corrupt. And then I start, and, and then that was the moment when I fall in love with anti-corruption. Because I said, I can't believe that companies don't understand that they have a role in preventing corruption. And I'm from Latin America. So when you, when you saw all these scandals and, and all these like briberies between mm -hmm. private and, and private sector, and then you have one side of the coin that that told you and at me at that time, no, I'm not responsible. And I said, are you kidding me? Because always there are two parts. And then when, it was really funny because the, what I did and what I'm doing right now is because companies told me, no, I'm not interested in this. Right. And, and then uh, th th that is why I start and uh, felt in love actually with anti-corruption. 
Awesome. So, so yeah, so now you've been doing this for a while now. So you've seen a lot of different examples of corruption, kind of like I said at the beginning, you know, I think a lot of people and, and you even had this experience, you know, when you were initially pitching your business to people, you know, we, we normally see corruption in these larger organizations, the fortune 500 companies, you know, government entities and stuff like that. But it does happen in smaller firms and in smaller businesses. And so when it does happen in smaller firms, what does that sort of corruption kind of look like? Yes, it's very interesting because as working with a lot of small companies all my life, I realized, uh, first I want to review a little because in, in all my job working with big companies in anti-corruption, mm -hmm. I realized that the big companies actually do this and they have compliance programs and monitoring. That is what we do actually. We, we don't implement, we monitor anti-corruption uh, compliance programs. Uh, I realized that most of them do this because of the law or because mm -hmm. they are afraid of the law, especially the US law, the FCPA law and, and the DOJ, the Department of Justice in the United States. But then, and, but not because they think that they can be corrupt, mm -hmm. because nobody wants to feel that right. could be corrupt. So, so what I, I started realizing with smaller companies is that if big companies don't think that they can be corrupt, smaller companies, is, they, they didn't feel this either. Yeah. And yes, and smaller companies usually have the owner in the company. Mm -hmm. So when you, you talk about corruption with a person that is in charge of company, it's really difficult because usually that person, no, nobody consider themselves corrupt. So right. usually, usually that person said, no, this is impossible because I'm in charge. And I know everything what is happening in my, in my company because I'm there. It's not like a board member that I don't know what they're doing. It's me that I'm there. So usually smaller companies, they don't do anything to prevent corruption because they said everything is on me. Mm -hmm. And that is a big mistake because smaller companies have a lot of people there and, and not because the owner is dead, is there, is that they are not going to commit anything, especially an employee. And a lot of time I realized that when corruption happened with sm smaller companies or with small companies, it's because the employees think that they are doing something good for the company. They are not realizing that they are paying a bribe sometimes. They said, no, this is good. And for example, in this country, the, there is a lot of corruption. And the, if the government asks me for money, I'm going to give the money to them because I don't want that the company die or have problems with this. And especially today with this world, like the, this is, is global world with companies, even small companies are in more than one country and they always want to grow up. And especially with the startups that today, I, I don't understand because it's the economic crisis, but at the same time, it's a lot of money for startups. And you see yeah. VCs and venture capital just giving away money and you say that we are in a really big economic crisis and the, these VCs are giving money to companies to grow up and to grow up really fast. So you can have a company with 20 employees one year and mm -hmm. 100 or 200 next year. Companies operating in one country one year and operating in 10 countries the next year. So how, how uh, you manage all of that? And how you uh, face the, re the realities of different cultures and different countries? And that is very important. Doesn't matter if the owner is not corrupt, but how the owner know what every employee is doing. And a lot of times it's because they want to do something good for the company. So what I realized with small companies, a lot of time they pay bribes, especially like private bribes. And sometimes it's not for the government. And they said, no, I should pay to this company, to this big company that is my client, because someone in that company asked me for money. Usually, because not everybody is good, but usually sometimes people that is in, in charge of supplier or like that, every person that actually have some power without being monitored or without like the check and balance and accountability, 
all of us are capable to do that in that position and we need to under and companies need to understand that to put some controls and do those, some take and balance on that but i have in latin america a lot of friends that actually are owners of companies mm -hmm. that they pay to these big companies and they say it's not my fault it's the fault of the big company that is asking me for the bribe and and i always said it's your fault <laughs> Because it's not the big company that is asking you for money. Yeah. And usually that company doesn't know that this one person that is doing this. And this company doesn't benefit from your bribe. For, for there it's bad because maybe they are paying higher or a lot mm -hmm. of things, but you are the one or your company is the one that is going to benefit for this, for paying. So if someday someone realized this, the law is going against you, not against the big company, because the big company is the victim of one employee in the big company. So uh, this is very important for a small companies, especially because they need to realize this and be able to denounce this to that potential client. Say you have a, a bad employee here that is asking for, for rights for us, like small company. Yeah. So, you know, and, and just listening to you talk, you know, I mean, it, it almost sounds like, um, you know, we hear the word corruption and it, and it has a very negative connotation to it. And it almost sounds like, you know, someone or something that is corrupt is just inherently evil. But it kind of sounds like to me, in a lot of cases, and a lot of experiences that you've had, a lot of times it's just people who weren't aware of what they were were not supposed to be doing is that is that accurate is it is it you know a lot of times more just people just unaware of what was actually illegal at the time but it was still considered corruption or were or is it in general most people doing it on purpose i think that that most of times they are not aware and if we if you put all the people in the world and you put them like in a gauss bell or something like that Mm -hmm. Maybe 5% of the people in the world is really bad, like the narcos or the criminals or like, because right. it's bad people actually in the world. But I think that the major, and maybe 5% is really good. <laughs> like, the, yeah. I don't know. Like, but, but I think that all of us or the majority of the people, we are on the middle. And we, we uh, take actions and do things according to incentives. And why this happened and why corruption actually exists is not because we are full of bad people or companies are full of bad people. This is because people act with two like goals or, or th th those things, two things happens in, uh, in the brain. One is the auto justification because we auto justify our actions. It's not that because our brain, our brain doesn't allow us to believe that we are doing something bad. So what our brain told to us, you are doing this for the company, this is good, you are paying to get the permit, but it's not your fault. It's fault of this country because this country works like that. Always is fault of the politicians, the public people, but always, and, and with the example that I was telling you about small company and big company and like private bribery between them, it's the same. It's the fault of the big company. It's not fault of me because I'm good. I'm an entrepreneur. I own a small company, blah, blah, blah. So, so people auto justify these actions in their brain because they are not prepared to hear that this may be corruption because we don't talk about corruption actually because we yeah. don't want to hear the word corruption. It's an ugly word. Yeah. And on the other hand, when you go to companies, Companies always put the incentives in most of the times in short term results. And I, I'm a member of different boards of companies. And I realized being in the board that usually the goals are on the like last line of the Excel or the statement. It's like, okay, I need this. This was the budget that we project last year. And now we need to achieve this. And when people, that work in different departments or in charge of different departments of a company, for example, the commerce, the commercial guy or the human resources or finance, 
or all the departments, if you separate the companies with departments and different budgets for this, for each department, when they achieve the results or when, where, when the outcome is good, usually nobody asks anything. So they know if they achieve the results, for example, the commercial department, if they achieve all the sales uh, that they need to do for this year and everything, Everything said, oh, congratulations, you are really good. Wow, wow, we are a really good company. But nobody asked, how did you achieve these outcomes? Was COVID, is an economical crisis? No, but nobody asked when the outcomes are good. But what happened when them are not good? Everyone asked, oh, how did you do this? So the incentives of people is most about the what, or this final line, than the how they are doing this. So I think that, and, and that is the change that I want to make and the message that I want to leave to companies. A lot of companies said like, no, I'm a good company and I'm sustainable and I'm working with ESGs and blah, blah, blah. But they are not worried of how they are achieving their goals. And here I have a suggestion for, for the audience to watch some, like the last series, like, like the real time, like we grad about we work or the dropout about, about Terranos or the Uber scandal. This is very interesting because if you see the founders of these companies as Adam Newman for we work and Elizabeth Cohn for Terranos, they were really good people with a really good purpose in charge of a company that, of companies that wanted to change the world. Like the way you do like a blood exam or the way you work. And they had really, really good purpose. But then if you see what happened in the middle, they were so focused, so, so focused in the short term outcome or in success with their businesses that finally they lie, they commit fraud and a lot of things. I, I don't want to spoil for the ones that, <laughs> that didn't watch the, the series, but this is like, th there are real stories. But just because they were working, in, they were worrying about the what and not the how they are they achieved us. And I think that what is a lack of our society is that we start asking ourselves about the how a long time ago. And we need to start asking ourselves again about that how. Yeah. So, you know, it, obviously it starts there. I mean, what are some other steps that, you know, smaller businesses can take to prevent, you know, different kinds of corruption from occurring in, in their business? I think that the, the, the first one is that the owner or the, the one in charge need to be convinced about this mm -hmm. and need to understand the different ways that actually this could happen. Maybe it's paying by a permit or paying to gain a new client or a bid with the government or, you don't know. But I think that that is like the first, first one. And then they need to put on right a lot of policies and controls, like how they do things, how they are going to, uh, if they have a commercial policy, for example, or a policy for suppliers with whom they want to work. Because a lot of time, especially for smaller business that they need to a lot of outsource a lot of activities and, with whom I am I am outsourcing this activity and even ask the right question, why this one is too cheap? Maybe because it's a company from a criminal that, that just want to, to laundry money or things like that. So, so they need to first to get all the policies on Brighton, but identify the risk actually, and the risk at different, and they do this, this exercise maybe every year because maybe they are growing and they are growing fast. So how are the new risks that we are facing as companies? And then with that following and monitor that they actually were doing this, because what is the big problem with compliance program in every country? It's not just like, like from here, but is that they have, companies have a lot on, on Brighton and big manuals and how to behave and everything, but they don't, they don't follow that because it's really difficult to have visibility about that. So they need to monitor that they are doing this and even put the 
incentive policy and the compensation policy based on that. Doesn't matter if the commercial department achieve all their goals, but if they don't do it according to the alignments of the company, doesn't matter. They are not following what the company wants to be. So, so I think that that is very important. That, and for a, for a small business, it's easier than for a big one because. Well, at the beginning, you have like less people, so it's easy to communicate, but you need to really like monitor this because if you don't monitor, then when the company starts growing, how do you know that the guy that you have working like five uh, like or five departments from you or in another country or working from home actually is following these procedures? Got it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, just other things that I've that I've heard you talk about. I mean, driving home the importance of of having your your processes and your systems documented, and making sure that that element uh, of it is is absolutely included. Um, one final question I have for you. I mean, you know, what what kind of role can a smaller firm play, kind of in the overall governance of corruption? Yes, I think, and that is what I was telling you before about the, the role of every company to prevent corruption because if company says no i really believe that company corruption could maybe not disappear but actually reduce a lot because always if you see all these scandals is a company on the other side and i think that the first advice or how they could like stop corruption is saying no and then nothing when it is actually happening but what happened with small companies and having a lot of talk with them, they said, I have too much to lose. Mm. If I the news, um, for example, the owners of the big company or people of the government are involved in this corruption act about asking me money, for example, I know that I'm not going to be able to work with them again. I had heard a lot of stories of companies, especially when, when they are going, small companies that are going to another country. And they said, if I don't pay to that government, my company is going to be kicked out and I have competitors that actually are, are paying. So it's always this trade-off. How I do, how I survive saying no in some context when the only way to survive is saying yes. So always my advice is the news. And today we are in, in a good term to do this because transparency and with the technology and everything is more, it's easier to be transparent. It's like, um, everything is like recorded or is somewhere. So yes, you need to be brave as a company, especially as small company to say no. But I really believe that in long terms is going to benefit the company because everyone talk about like the, the, the big scandals and for example, Goldman Sachs paying in Malaysia or Goldman paying in Mexico or Polo Rafloren paying in Argentina. So it, we have like all this scandal of companies that actually favorite in different countries. But nobody talks about the scandals with small companies because they're not attractive for the mm. press or for the newspaper. Right. But this actually happened, happened a lot. And the difference with the big companies scandal is that the, the, the authorities leave these companies to survive because we need them. And everyone needs the company and said, okay, yes, we can't kill this company or go, True again. So they pay like they pay like millionaire sanctions and a lot of money, but still the company is there. And they promise that they are not doing this again. And they have monitors and they need to implement an anti-corruption program and everything. But there is a lot of scandals with small company. And please go to the FCPA page, or if you Google like FCPA plus corruption scandals, you're going to find a lot of small companies involved. But we never know more about them. And it's because they die. Mm -hmm. A small company can be, can willing the, the opportunity to actually pay a bribe and get discovered because then they're going to kill that company because now nobody matters. It's like, okay, no, nobody's going to notice that this company uh, doesn't exist anymore. 
So I think that this is really, really important. And not because, just because the law, but also because the role that companies have in this society. And if we talk more about ESGs and sustainability and the world with, that we are facing, I really believe that the tense is not going to come from governments. I think that, that the world and COVID doesn't help for, for the world we are facing because every country was like more inside. Even we are society, I'm more connected than ever because Zoom and this kind of tools, like to be able to meet doesn't matter where we are. But at the same time, countries are thinking more in themselves than ever. Before we had like all these organizations with a lot of power as United Nations, uh, 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 the OCDE and, and a lot of organizations working for the world. But now it's like every country is worrying what is happening to themselves. So who are the ones who actually have the role to make a tent? There are companies. And because companies are growing, 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 growing really fast. And, and today you, you have, we have companies that are bigger than countries actually. So, so I think that the way that we do business is going to have a direct correlation with the world that we are going to face in 10 years from now. And all the small companies have an, a really important role in this. And the first one is saying no, but the other ones is be convinced about this, about how like the good behavior and integrity and, and being like current with what they say and they do that is what, what, what is going to reestablish the trust in the world. I think that one of the big, big problems that we have now is a trust crisis. And if you see Edelman barometer or another ways that they actually measure trust, trust has been like depressing all over the years, but companies can do the difference. And I think that small companies, because they don't have like the all the backpack that the companies actually have, mm -hmm. uh, they could make a difference and reestablish the trust in the world. Awesome. Trust in people, trust in company, trust in the private sector. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and that's and that's really important. Um, how can people learn more about you and uh, your company, BH Compliance? Okay, you can contact me. I'm Susana Sierra. My you can look the company webpage is b8 dot uh pause how do you say the the line hyphen dash okay v8 hyphen compliance dot com or yes you can email me to susana dot sierra at b8 hyphen compliance dot com Awesome. Yeah. And I will have that information uh, in the show notes for everybody. Um, this has been really great. I, I've, I've learned a lot just listening to you and just kind of getting a better understanding of, of what this world looks like and, and just all of the things that, that you encounter and, and, and you see and, and help people with. I do have one final question for you. It's one we ask all of our guests here. And that is, if you had one final piece of advice for our listeners, what would it be? It would be like, think more in the how that in the what i think that we are living like fast track and we are just thinking in the outcome sometimes and in what we are doing but we need like maybe to basis and, and start like thinking more in how we are doing things because that is what actually matters at the end love it yeah absolutely i, I couldn't agree more uh, that's going to do it for us this week here on Center Stage. I uh, hope that was helpful for everybody. I hope you guys learned something. Uh, I hope you're inspired to try to make sure that you know any holes are plugged up and that you're not uh, unknowingly uh, being corrupt in your firm. And so uh, if you are, definitely encourage you to reach out to Suzanne and see uh, how she can help. But that's going to do it. Thank you so much for uh, rating and reviewing the show wherever you're consuming it and all the feedback that you guys continue to send in. I really do appreciate it. And that's it. Susanna, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for listening. To learn more, go to spotlightbranding.com slash center stage.